Hello, everybody. This is Noah and John, and we are from Urban Digs, and we are talking Manhattan. And John, I'm very proud to have Sean Osher here today. He is the founder of CORE. I've known him a long, long time. He's awesome. Talk about having the pulse on the market. And uh, he's going to tell everyone what's going on. Great. Let's get started. Let's, let's not waste time. Sean, thank you for joining us. Sure. Thanks, guys, for having me on. Uh, should be fun. Yeah, definitely will be. So let's just start high level, Sean. Um, you sit at the top of core. You got a lot of agents underneath you. You see a lot of deal flow go your way. What is going on in the markets today? Um, well, that's a trillion dollar question, I guess. It's, uh, you know, honestly, in the 30, almost 30 years I've been doing this, it's probably the most difficult uh, time to answer that question uh, because there are so many different things going on in the market today. Um, so you know, it's very difficult to kind of get your finger on the pulse of exactly where we are. Um, you know, obviously, 2020 was devastating for New York City. Um, not only were we, were we in, you know, the throes of a bad market to start off with, but it was exacerbated with this pandemic. Um, we couldn't work because we were shut down for three months. And then, you know, consumer confidence kind of was eradicated. People fleed the city, as you read. Um, maybe not as many as you thought, but uh, we did see kind of a nice rebound uh, last month of December, and we're cautiously optimistic with some, you know, very good news, both on the, you know, vaccine front um, and things that will drive consumer confidence to a better place that there's an uptick in the market, and we'll see how long that is here for. Yeah, and we definitely see the uptick too, um, and, and I hear you on, like, it's tough to figure out where we are because there's, there's not a lot of price discovery yet. Like we don't really have all of those COVID trades in the, in the pipeline yet. I'm sure there's developments that we're still waiting to get some deals going on there. Um, and I want to just pivot for a second to developments because you do have a special kind of um, um, neat understanding of that sector. Um, what's going on in that sector compared to the regular resale market? Um, so, you know, it does mirror that market. It's kind of like the tale of two markets uh, in new development as well. You've got winners and losers mm -hmm. uh, and, um, you know, there's some projects that have been beautifully conceived and well marketed and are really good value from a, you know, consumer standpoint that are doing pretty well in, in spite of this terrible market. And then you have those projects that were lagging pre COVID, and they've just gotten worse. Um, so there's, there's not really one rule of thumb to say, you know, everything is selling quickly at full price, you know, days on the market is short. Um, we're seeing projects that are doing incredibly well um, in light of the you know current conditions, and then we're seeing projects that are really suffering. Right. So if I'm a buyer out there right now, am, am I having trouble finding a good deal in the new development sector because of that varying, isolated situation in each building? Yeah, because a deal a deal is a relative term, right? So you know we've been talking that I, I you know the new like hot uh, adjective that described buyers. And I'm sure you've heard this a lot from a lot of your guests over the last five to 10 years is that buyers are getting more sophisticated. Mm -hmm. You know, that word sophisticated. But I think this year, that's gonna be a year of reckoning to exactly what the word sophisticated means when it comes to the perspective of the buyer. So, you know, when you talk about value, you know, what does the buyer value? You know, it's not only dollars and cents and it's not only square footage, two barometers that we've used to analyze data, you know, and as a metric that we've used. There are all of those intangibles that come into play when you know, we talk about value. Do buyers want a view? Do they want amenities? What's the quality of the construction of the building? What is the neighborhood uh, like? You know, all of these other things that come into play, you know, I would argue that there are things on the market now that are 2,400 a foot that are very, very good value for a buyer. And I'm seeing some things on the market now at 1,500 foot that are not good value. Right. So, you know, it, it's, you have to be sophisticated to kind of navigate the value in this market and understand where the intangible value lies. That's very interesting. And, and let, me, let me touch on one of the things that you mentioned, you know, in, in passing in a few of your statements, and that's, that's the consumer and the consumer and consumer confidence. And I'm curious, you know, when you talk about that spread of value, like how does consumer confidence play into that? At what, at what point does price sort of trump confidence? Consumer confidence is the most important barometer in real estate sales, in sales period. But if we feel good and uh, there's momentum in the market and there's a sense of urgency, prices go up and things sell quickly. 
if there's no consumer confidence, you know, things lag. Um, now, having said that, I think all, good real estate always sells regardless of the market, really depends on where it's going to sell. But consumer confidence will drive the market. And I've seen this over 30 years, you know, and um, in New York City, we've seen consumer confidence turn on a dime. Um, you know, we've seen it get shattered, you know, three huge events in 2001, in 2008, and then in 2020. And we've seen it turn around at different moments of time. Um, so, I mean, it's a huge barometer. You know, there is a consumer confidence index, but the best way to kind of gauge it is by knowing what buyers are thinking, how they're feeling. And, you know, the real estate agents are the ones who are the communicators of that information and have their finger on the pulse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's all about those bids, right? It's all about those bids. And we're just, we're just trying to figure out where those bids are. And we're just trying to capture that, that market. And I think even the bids, we're trying to figure out where, where the market is. Yeah, we're seeing a lot of bids and we're seeing, you know, in the last 24 hours, I've dealt with personal, you know, listings and situations and agents where we've seen bids as low as 30% off the ask and our sellers are not capitulating. Right. You know, I think the market has adjusted. I think the perception of the seller has adjusted um, of, of the value of the real estate, which is good for the market. And I think we'll start seeing a lot more movement and it's going to take a lot more transactions to kind of tell us where the market is. Yeah, I agree with that. And I mean, I don't think we're dislocated anymore, Sean. I mean, all the data that we're having is showing a huge rebound. In fact, yeah. December was the best month for contract activity in all of 2020. That's how yeah. we ended the year. So, I mean, I assume that you're seeing the same data um, in your firm. Yeah, so absolutely. December was saved the year for us. I mean, it was a, it was a great month. And um, right. we'll see what happens, you know, in the coming coming months. Right. What about rentals? You know, I spoke to a major landlord in the city and he said it's the first time in his career that, you know, used to be you can adapt your portfolio to by lowering the price. If you want to lease something, you just had to lower the price. Mm -hmm. for the first time this year, there was no there was no bottom. Um, you know, apartments were just sitting empty and you couldn't lease them up, you know, almost for nothing. Um, so very, very difficult if you're a landlord. Um, you know, on the other side, we've seen that the luxury rental segment, uh, most of those people are paying rents because they're not in a position where, you know, they don't have the money to pay the rent. So they've been paying the rents, they've been re renegotiating leases, and there's definitely been a reset in the rental market. And obviously that's, that's happened a lot quicker than in the uh, for sale market, just because of the length of time of a transaction. Have you noticed that any of these renters are um, sort of buyers waiting on the sidelines or are these people who are have, have their confidence to go back to that discussion is not quite there yet to, to pull the trigger? Great question. Um, I, I think <laughs> it's a bit of both. I mean, I think, you know, we're dealing with a new generation of people mm -hmm. who are not buyers. They don't see and value the American dream the way past generations have. They're not interested in building equity to the extent that we've seen in the past um, because they're much more about the experience and a temporary experience. You know, if they move to a city or to a place or to an apartment, you know, they don't see themselves being in the same place in 10, 15, 20 or 30 years. So that's had a major effect on the mentality of, you know, renters versus buyers. Um, on the flip side, it's really difficult to argue against buying in this environment, you know, this, if, you're, if you have the uh, consideration of buying something, I think you'd be very foolish not to plunge into that market right now. You've got a historically low uh, mortgage rate environment. And I don't know how many times I've said that over the last you know, two years, but it keeps getting better. It's silly for you not to buy if you're gonna be in a home for anywhere for three to five years. You know, and even from an investment standpoint, you know, it's a good move. So I think we're starting to see some of those people come back. I think we're starting to see some renters, you know, consider getting into the market to buy, um, not only from a uh, home ownership standpoint for living there, but from an investment standpoint. No, that's, that's really, that's, go ahead, John. Yeah, go ahead, Noah. I was gonna say, I was interesting. I wanna stick on rates for a second. There's a lot of talk. I'm talking to a lot of lenders. I'm talking to a lot of macro guys. I'm talking to a lot of traders that I keep in touch with and, and, a lot of them have a consensus that there's about a year. We got about a year with rates where we are. Maybe we go lower, maybe we, but like looking ahead 22, 23, 24, they're starting to talk about 
the fact that we're, we're going to see that go the other way, um, which is something we're not used to. And you might see some, you know, fear of missing. I guess people want to just get in before the kind of the rate thing. But that, that wasn't my question. That was just something I wanted to raise. Mm -hmm. My question was with, with the cycle, this cycle, this down cycle, 2020, could you compare that to, to other cycles that you've been through? You've been in this market for a long time. So how does this compare to previous down cycles? Um, I think it compares to 2008 in the way that it was undeniable that the market needed to shift from a value standpoint, right? You couldn't, like if a real estate agent was speaking to a seller, you know, for the last five years, the sellers had the argument, oh, my apartment's worth a lot more. You know, the guy next to me sold, you know, for more money and the woman above me sold for more. So I'm going to ask more. And it was very difficult for the real estate agent to have that, you know, moment of reckoning and reason about the value of a homeowner. Um, and, and, and I think, you know, it's indisputable now that things have adjusted, that prices have come down. Um, no seller can have that argument that their property is worth more. So, you know, for the longest time, it was the assumption that you bought an apartment in New York City, uh, you lived in it and you would sell it and you'd always make a profit. Um, like 2008, we're in a moment now where I think a lot of people who are sellers are actually going to lose money on their acquisition. Um, so I think that was, that's a parallel that we saw in 2008, whereas before there was a lot of denial in, in the minds of the sellers. Um, but, you know, having said that, it's, you know, no cycle is ever the same. And that's what makes this challenging. That's why you need experts who have their finger on the pulse, who are navigating this market as it goes and kind of peeling the layers off the onion to understand what's going on and where the opportunities lie. So, um, but the- Are there the, opportunities? Oh, Sorry. there's, I, I, you know, there's, there's tons of opportunities. I mean, you just have to have the creative mind, patience and tenacity to stick with it, look at it and, you know, and um, seize the opportunity when you see it. Is there, so, is there any place that you would, if you, if you had a bunch of money to be put to work, that you would focus on any sectors? Oh, I mean, you know, I know residential. So, I mean, you know, I've sold a lot of commercial buildings, but ultimately for residential use at the end of the day. So, you know, I think there's huge opportunity in the residential market, both for buyers uh, and an even bigger opportunity for developers. Mm -hmm. The problem we've had in New York City has not really been an inventory problem. It's been a product problem. You know, you've seen the projects that have done well, that have sold well. And usually those are the outlying projects that have delivered the right product to market that the client wants. Um, that's, that's, where, that's the key to success, delivering what the consumer wants, what they value and what they'll pay a premium for. And to be honest, most of the product we've seen come to the market in New York City over the last 10 years has been subpar. Interesting. You know, so I think there's a huge opportunity for developers who you know, we'll take the chance, deliver something to market that consumers want. Yeah, and no, it's, consumers change. We, we're constantly changing the way we want to live in our homes. You know, um, you know, you buy a home that was built in 1920. The bedrooms are small. There's no closet space. The kitchens are teeny. There's a maid's room maybe off the kitchen. You know, because that's the way they used to live back then. They didn't have closets full of clothing. They didn't have, you know... But now we're in a, in a moment in time, a turning point in the evolution of, you know, the way we live in these urban environments where yeah. live work, as, a, as an example, everyone's going to want to work from home. You may yeah. not, you may not, you may still go into your office and, but you, you know, you want some kind of space in your home that's conducive to working. Very interesting. I, yeah. I, I think you make a fantastic point, John. I just like to rewind a few minutes to one of the earlier things you said, which is, and I think you're exactly right. If you look at the market, 2006 through 2008, or even 2007, really, the conversation was not really like opportunity as in I'm going to be here for a while and my place is going to appreciate it. My, the, the opportunity was sort of like, if I buy it now, I can sell it in two years and I'm going to make 20%. Then came the reckoning, 2009, 2010, 11, 12. But the, th the crazy thing is, you know, when you, when you look at the sellers who are selling now, the people who are losing money are the ones that bought at the peak, the ones that are sort of falling into that trap of like, oh, I, I got to buy, you got to make, you know, it's the, the Bitcoin mentality sort of on real estate. But the people who bought 2010, 11, 12, they're doing fine. Yeah, they're not going to make, they're, they're below their high water mark of a couple of years ago or maybe last spring, but they're going to be, they're going to be just fine. And it's just, you know, all, despite all of the- Also after 9-11. Yeah. yeah. And, and then, you know, the other thing is when you start to look at what's selling now at this moment of opportunity, when there was blood on the streets, when there was sort of, 
you know, crazy things happening. If you're in that apartment now, you buy that apartment now that has that room for the office, that has that room for school, that has that, that extra room for life these days, that's the kind of thing that's only going to appreciate in time because that's what people are wanting. And as more people realize that, simply the, the, the demand is going to grow. A hundred percent. And that's what I was alluding to when I talked about a sophisticated buyer and, and developer opportunities to deliver that to sophisticated buyers. I think a big difference we're going to see over the next five years is, as you said, you know, if you bought in 2001 and 2008, you could almost take a dart, throw it at an MLS, and whatever you bought, you, it would appreciate, you know, um, multiples over the course of the next five years. That's not going to be the case now. Um, there is no real blood on the street, so to speak. You know, the vultures are out there. They're circling. They're looking. There's a lot of money out there. Uh, but there is no real blood on the street. Not and anymore. there is opportunity. And I think those who are smart enough to understand the opportunity from a value standpoint in, in the way the buyer will see value appreciating over the next five years, mostly about how we use our homes. I mean, let's not forget that what we're selling are homes, right? And, you know, people who, you know, I've always said buying an apart a residential apartment is like falling in love. It's a completely irrational experience. And that, that element you can't quantify, you know, so... When you walk into a beautiful loft space, say, and it's got a home office, which is completely private and separate, it's got a guest suite, you know, it may not be the biggest, but, you know, people will fall in love with that concept. They'll fall in love with knowing, okay, this is how I can live my day-to-day -day existence in this home, and it's going to have a positive impact on my daily life. That's, I love, that's, I love it. I, to, to think, you know what? I'm really excited now, Sean. I am really excited right. to see in a couple of years what those buildings, those products, those new concepts, the work from home buildings, the work from home apartments specialized. And, and it's not something that's going to come this year. It's something that's going to probably come in. in, in I, I, I guess if you haven't started building it, you can change now. Yeah, I mean, we, we're, I don't know if you're familiar with Rose Hill, but we kind of, you know, this is not a new trend. We saw this, it's a project we're doing with Rockefeller. And our concept for the building, when we were in pre development four years ago, was this work from home. And it was a live work kind of, so we actually in the ground up building created home offices, we call them smart rooms. And we've seen you know, the sales and the prices reflect that people are falling in love with the concept and the way that they can use these homes. Mm -hmm. so, so it is successful, there is a case study. Love it. We, we need yeah. to see more of that. We need to see- You're early. Well, we were ahead of the curve, <laughs> absolutely, which is yeah. great, but we need to see more of it. We need to see more developers delivering affordable luxury homes that will resonate with the consumer. You will, you will. It's, it's gonna happen. I'm, I'm very yeah. confident it's gonna happen. It'll take a year, a couple of years, but it'll happen. So listen, we're running out of time. I got one last question here, um, an agent productivity question. We got a lot of professional agents listening to these shows. Um, is there anything that you're noticing in terms of um, practices, um, in terms of characteristics, behavior of, of your most successful agents, what they've done in the last 12 months to, to navigate and excel? that you maybe could pass on that other agents can learn from? Yeah, it's old school fundamental values um, that will stand the test of time. I've always said this, um, I'm, you know, it's kind of like the common sense, basic things. Be responsive, communicate with people, connect, make sure you're providing, you know, this is a service industry. So make sure you're providing a service to the client. This is not a tech business. We've seen a lot of people kind of, you know, trying to come in and, disrupt our industry with tech and, and, and eliminate the middleman. Um, you know, that's not going to happen. And, and the agents, what I've seen this last year, and I think we're going to see a lot more of it, there are nearly 20,000 licensed real estate agents in the city. When I came into the market, there were 3,500. I think what we're going to see is that the agents who take this business seriously because it is a difficult business and if you can deliver a high level of intelligence and service to your clients, you're going to be valued. Those agents will have the opportunity to have their best year in the business ever. And I've had some of those agents this year. They had huge years in, in light of this, you know, in spite of this COVID. Um, yeah. But I, and I think we're going to see a lot of people who maybe don't have what it takes, who aren't ready to, you know, make the sacrifices that it takes to be successful in this business, not able to do that and leave the industry. And I think it's a, going to be a year of separating the man from the boys, so to speak, or the women from the girls, or, you know, it, it's, it's going to be a year of reckoning. And I think good agents are going to have their best years ever. And I think we're going to see a lot of people realize that this is not an easy industry. 
and you can't like just wing it. You know, you just, can't just fake it you make it in this business. Yeah, that's great. So consumers are confused. And, and if they're confused, they need someone to guide them and tell them what's going on. And, and, and agents are in a great position right now to earn credibility and trust and respect through yeah. this crisis, through good information and good navigation and good consulting in this service business. And they will tell their friends and their family, and that's how you grow it um, over time. So, 100%. Yeah, awesome. John, any, any final questions for Sean? No, I think Sean, uh, it was another masterclass from uh, Sean. So let's just it is. leave it at that. Oh, yeah. I appreciate it. I got a hey. question for you, Noah. Uh-oh. Yes. Did you play the guitar back there? I do, but you're not uh, going to ask me. We, we got to do a duet then. We'll set that up. I would love to do a duet with you, and we will definitely set that up. And, and if we can get more than five people to listen, I'll be so excited. So, um, All right, well, we got John. John, you're committed. I, uh, I think I'm busy that day. I think I can get my <laughs> wife and kids, so we're good. We got five. I would love to. That is Sean Osher. That is John Walker. I am Noah Rosenblatt. We are from Urban Digs. We are talking Manhattan, and we'll catch you next time.